Okay, so today we have a very special episode with our programmatic community with someone that I would guess it doesn't need an introduction for all our programmatic geeks everywhere. Uh, Brian O'Kelly, welcome. We are so happy to have you here. You can see it on our smiles. <laughs> My pleasure to be here. Well, so I wanted to start a, a short introduction to everyone that's here listening. So I recently read a scope three report that it was launched in the beginning of the year. And there was a, like this phrase that struck me that I thought it was like really interesting is, did you guys know that serving a thousand digital impressions like a CPM uses the same amount of energy as washing a load of laundry. That absolutely struck me and thought like how many impressions we serve for a second. So Brian, if you want, you can introduce oh, wow. yourself and start talking about the- <laughs> how, did, how much laundry did you do? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, I mean, for me, I started in programmatic before programmatic. Um, I sort of accidentally invented the SSP in 2004. Um, the, actually, the SSP came before the ad exchange. Uh, I was working at a little ad network called Right Media, and we had a competitor that would tell publishers they were getting a $5 CPM. And we were like, I mean, back then, the average CPM was probably 25 cents or something, you know, but how the heck do they do this? And so one day I asked, uh, one of the publishers to send me a report. Cause I was like, you know, we're back then we used to daisy chain. Like you'd choose your first network, then your second network, then your third, they'd bounce. And uh, they sent us the report and this competitor was getting a $5 CPM for like 5,000 impressions. And we were getting a 25 cent CPM for a million impressions. We just couldn't figure it out. Like, why are they only counting 5,000? And it turned out that anything they couldn't monetize, they would just throw away. They wouldn't, you know, serve a PSA. They wouldn't redirect it. They would just pretend like it didn't happen. And the publishers didn't have any tools to track or count the impressions. And they didn't get the fact that the check they got at the end of the month was exactly the same size. It's just that we were monetizing all the impressions and they were only monetizing 5%. And so this was like, you know, a head exploding moment for me. I said, well, what if we could just auction every ad and ask all of the networks whether they'll pay for it at the same time. And so if they do have this amazing $5 CPM, they can take those and then we'll monetize the rest at 25 cents and the publisher will make twice as much money. And so that was the SSP. And then I went to the networks and said, can you guys do this? And they said, oh, we don't have the technology. We don't know how to bid on things. And so I had to invent the DSP to make my SSP work. And then all of a sudden, if you put the two together, you have an ad exchange. So if anyone asks which came first, the chicken or the egg, whichever one's the SSP came first. Um, and what happened was because this was so much more efficient for everybody, publishers had massive CPM improvements. Like they made a ton more revenue. Advertisers, instead of having to choose which network to work with, could bid on any of them and get all of the impressions. So all of the advertiser outcomes were better because they could always find the impressions they wanted. And all the ad networks started to make more money too because everyone had a different mix of traffic. So it was one of those perpetual motion machines where it was a win, win, win. Everybody who participated made more money. And so within, I'm not kidding, within months of launching the full ad exchange, we had more clients than we could handle. Um, and the way we knew that was because our servers, which at that point, you know, we were paying for on our credit cards, literally started to fry because we couldn't keep up with the traffic. And it'll make you laugh that uh, our biggest publisher was called MySpace. Um, and MySpace was going crazy back then. And MySpace, we have like a spike of volume and all the systems, like every ad company would fall over except for ours. Like we would just barely not fall over. And so every time they'd have a spike, half the ad tech companies would just fall over and die. We wouldn't, 
And so the next we, you know, MySpace get mad and fire like five ad networks. So every spike, they would lose partners. And we just kept getting more and more traffic. Um, so that is about computer science, because as a computer scientist, my specialty was distributed systems. So I knew how to build these super scalable systems that could handle massive amounts of traffic. So all of this comes back down to this idea that we think about programmatic being in the cloud, but it's actually happening in a data center. It's actually real servers using real energy, getting physically hot to the touch. And that's this gap. Now you imagine this isn't some crazy idea I had. All of a sudden, it's a $100 billion industry with a 1,000 companies doing this. Critio has 42,000 servers and eight data centers around the world. Google probably has a bazillion. That's a technical number I made up. Um, all these companies run these massive physical data center operations, or they outsource it to like Amazon. And so when we think about programmatic or digital advertising, it's actually happening physically in warehouses full of very hot servers. So that's this sort of connection point. So you think, well, how can an ad compare to a laundry load? Well, really auctioning an ad is just causing all of these servers and all of these data centers to spin up and use electricity and generate heat. So one load of laundry versus a thousand servers times a thousand ads, it's actually not surprising that if you need a million servers to serve those thousand ads, that the heat and energy actually is comparable to what's a relatively lightweight operation. And by the way, wash your clothes in cold water, it works just the same and it's way more energy efficient. Um, that's just my PSA for real life. Um, so I'm sort of an accidental climate warrior in the sense that I caused this problem. Like I didn't think I was going to cause a climate problem. Um, I think we all feel that way. Like no one thinks like, oh, you know, my clothes are better in hot water, but you're part of the problem. Um, scope three is this new company I started which is trying to quantify these choices so that we can make more sustainable decisions. So when you are trafficking a programmatic campaign, um, you know, if you've been taking this course and you're learning how and you're like, hey, you know, what should I do? I wanna make sure that you make choices that are climate first. And what we've just proven with some tests with major advertisers is that greener programmatic buying is also better programmatic buying. But all these super long supply chains with all these hops and all these crappy intermediaries, I mean, your money is going to the intermediaries and not to the publisher. And it actually performs worse. So basically coming full circle, my passion is making advertising more efficient. And it's frustrating that programmatic isn't solved 20 years later. I mean, it's been almost 20 years. And the fact that we're still learning some of these hacks that aren't about the, the heart of media buying, which is finding the right media for the right audience, for the right creative. We're talking about things like auction theory and SPO and intermediaries and all these acronyms. I, you don't even pronounce acronyms that way. I mean, I can't pronounce the darn word. Like, can we make this simple so we get back to the roots of media? Um, and so that's a lot of my story really is constantly trying to find better ways to make this industry work. Um, and trying not to have unintended consequences like, you know, millions of servers creating lots of heat and energy use. That's fascinating. And thank you so much for that amazing introduction. I think we had many highlights. Uh, maybe my favorite one was um, MySpace being one of your clients. <laughs> no, but like seriously, um, I think it's uh, super interesting on how uh, you created that change and and we were actually wondering like how come if you created all the platforms that basically uh, created programmatic the, the ecosystem like when exactly came this moment like what, what were you doing I don't know maybe you were cooking or you were watching a documentary like when did it came this moment you were like hey this is not right like I, I need to do something to solve it because you mentioned that you, you 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 feel like you have this mission like to solve this and to to don't have an impact on the ecosystem. Was there like an aha moment for you? Well, I think there's a couple moments because you know the challenges programmatic aren't just about sustainability. Um, there's privacy issues. Uh, there's transparency issues. There's you know fraud here and there. Um, I remember a moment 
probably in 2011 when I was talking to some of my data scientists at AppNexus and they said, hey, we think this is fraud. Like we think this particular client of ours is doing something fraudulent. And so I, I dug in, I looked at it and I was like, that does seem sketchy. And I actually called the client who I've known at this point for many years. I said, hey, this seems really sketchy. He's like, no, Brian, I promise you it's not sketchy. There's a logical explanation. And he explains it to me. And I'm like, that does sound pretty good. Okay, yeah, 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 makes sense. Like a month later, we hear the exact same concern from the data science team. And I'm like, but those guys stopped. My, my buddy, you know, he stopped doing it. And they're like, yeah, but now these guys are doing the exact same thing. I was like, well, wait a sec. So I call him up, like this different person I've known for a while. These are clients paying us money. I'm like, hey, like, can you stop? Like, that's not, that's not right. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll stop. Day later, it's somewhere else. And I'm like, we're playing whack-a-mole. Like, and, and what's gonna happen is, it's just gonna keep happening until the rules change. And it was like a, an aha moment for me that like the industry wasn't gonna figure this out. This wasn't gonna come from the IB or from like the ANA or like, these associations weren't gonna figure these things out. Like I was gonna have to make a call. And I started changing the rules. I started saying, as, as this particular example, like there was a feature where you could anonymize impressions. You could say, you know, I want to run this, you know, let's say it's the New York Times, I'm going to run it private because the New York Times didn't want their clients to know that they were selling programmatically because they didn't want to undermine their direct sales team. But all these networks were using this to take crap inventory and call it private not to protect a good publisher, but to mask a bad publisher. You know, it's funny, right? It was a, a feature built with sort of a good reason, but now it was being used for evil. And so we turned off this feature. We said, ads have to be transparent. And all the big quality publishers like the New York Times yelled at us and said, wait, you're, you're killing our business. You can't do this. And so this is the sort of trade-off, right? Like, what do we do? Do we make the New York Times mad? But close this fraud loophole? Do we only allow certain publishers to have private inventory? What happens if our competitors now get all the New York Times inventory? And meanwhile, all of our clients quit because we closed the loophole. So I guess what I'm saying is like, being at the heart of this moment and, and a series of these moments through the course of the life cycle of programmatic gave me this really strong sense of responsibility that this wasn't somebody else's problem. Like, these were choices that would change the trajectory of my business, of you know, the industry. So fast forward, I sell AppNexus, I get into sustainability through COVID actually, because I'm fascinated with supply chains. And I'm taking an MIT course on supply chains that has a sustainability module. And I was thinking about this for the real world. I was running a company that did physical supply chain management. We, we actually had 25% of all the copper coming into the US running through our platform. And I was thinking about all these complex supply chains. And I was like, I wonder if anyone's doing this analysis for programmatic. And I actually got a piece of paper, this piece of paper right here, which has now had coffee spilled on it. But I started writing out the digital supply chain in the context of sustainability. And so I did this for a couple different you know, supply chains. And I was like, dang, you know, like that's a lot. And just started asking people like, did you know this is real? Did you know this is significant? And, you know, here we are two years later, I'm still completely obsessed. I've built this entire piece of paper, this whole thing into a product. So you can look at any supply chain and programmatic and see the actual emissions from it. Um, but in the same way, like, 10 years ago, I was like digging into these things, like really trying to deeply understand what was happening. I get to do that with a really, really good cause, which I think also addresses a lot of the other programmatic issues. So that's sort of the series of aha moments, but it just came down to doodling on a piece of paper. Um, I can barely even read it at this point, but I'm sure it was really good. There you go. Thank you. So uh, that's that's quite interesting because actually, let that uh, supply chain curse that you were doing. I guess it translates it what later or right now we talk about like SPO on the programmatic uh, ecosystem and what we try to achieve 
uh, when creating like a more greener ecosystem. I was wondering if, if you could tell us a bit about that. And before we dive in into that, I don't know if anyone has any questions, uh, any comments. Well, <laughs> if you want, uh, we can, we can talk a bit about uh, SPL uh, for anyone like listening that it's wondering, like we have so many acronyms in programmatic. So what is SPL? So uh, supply path optimization. It's basically uh, what the process that it has been trying to be imposed uh, for the publisher side and also the demand side. So we can start selling or buying programmatic ads in a more direct way. So Ryan, you can take it from here. Yeah, so you may have heard my secret superpower name, which is B-O-K or Bach. Um, that stands for Brian O'Kelly, if you didn't get the math. But of course, the only way to solve acronyms is to create new ones. So I was like, well, one more TLA, like the industry needs it. Um, but the reason my blog exists, Bach on ads, is because at AppNexus, as I was mentioning, I kept finding all these problems with programmatic. And one of the problems was, a, like these really long supply chains are super inefficient. Um, I wasn't thinking about carbon, I was just thinking about cost. And so I had this idea that buyers, so it used to be that DSPs would brag about how many QPS they have. Like we see 500 million a day, or no, we see 5 billion a day. And everyone would just brag about how much volume they could handle. Now, from a sustainability lens, that's crazy. But it's also crazy because what happened was people would just send the same ad as many times as they could. So you'd run it through every single SSP and they would sell it to each other and just get bounced back and forth until, yeah, you have tons of QPS, but no brand new impressions. Duplication was a huge problem. And all the DSPs were terrified of choosing favorites. And so I had this idea that DSPs should choose the best supply path. And because AppNexus was both a buyer and a seller, we probably would choose our own path for various reasons, partially because if I looked at all the paths and ours wasn't the best, I would just go make it the best. Like I would go cut our price with a publisher or go fix it. And so even if we were completely neutral, like we had this set of information to know when we were not competitive. And so I said to my team, like, let's launch this. And they said, no, they said, you're going to kill the SSP business. Because honestly, the best path is if we just cut everybody out and go straight to the publisher. And by the way, we just invented pre-bid at this point. So, you know, we'd open sourced our header bidding wrapper as pre-bid. And so if you look at on one side, pre-bid and the other side, SPO, what you see is this massive squeezing of the SSP business. We made $100 million a year as an SSP. And so my management team was like, hey, we're trying to go public here. You can't like just blow up a third of our business because it's the right thing to do. And I was like, well, isn't that more or less my thing? Like blowing up our business because it's the right thing to do? Like, and they're like, yeah, but can we just make our money first? And so we had this big fight. And I, I totally get their point because that was my money too. Uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't not take this idea and put it out there. So I was like, fine, I won't post this as Brian O'Kelly, CEO of App Texas. I'll go create an online persona and post it on my blog as Bach on ads. And so if you go to Bach on ads, you'll see that the first post is introducing supply path optimization. So I, I invented this idea. And of course, everyone went crazy in the industry. It is still being talked about today, which means it was a failed blog post, right? Because it obviously didn't work if seven years later, we're still talking about SBO. Um, but I think the idea that buyers should choose paths totally changed the way programmatic works. And in fact, as a knock-on effect, it forced Google to switch ADX from being a second price auction to a first price auction. So that's kind of cool. At least <laughs> my blog post did something. Um, but going to the sustainability side, one of the learnings of SPO is that buyers, even a really all-powerful, all-knowing buyer, still today has a hard time knowing which paths are the best. And if you're just a trader on a seat on a DSP, good luck. Because on one side, you've got agencies who really have preferred deals with certain partners, and they don't want you to choose the best partner in your mind. 
they want you to choose the one that they have a deal with. You've got DSPs that have routing or not. And then you have this opaque supply chain that you can't control. So my theory has been SPO has to be done outside in, not per seat, not per campaign, but we need kind of a exogenous pressure to say, what are the best supply paths and in a clear way um, that aligns with economics, which is probably more terrifying than what I was implying seven years ago, which was, hey, we should do this. You know, it would be good. Now I'm saying we have to do this because this is a climate disaster. And if we don't, we're going to be like melting down. You know, I, I want to take my kids skiing someday. Like, you know, I want mountains to have snow. So we got to do this for real. So we're going to get serious about it. Um, so that's sort of the journey of SPO. And my hope for all of you is that if you're in this industry in five years, you don't talk about it because it's how things work, that there is no supply path. It's smushed. And we're talking about, hey, how do I find the right inventory? When I started in this industry, it was like, we talk about like, which creative performs the best. We didn't talk about like, is that it, it, all the mechanics and pipes weren't the point or my, my boss would say like, hey, I really hate skyscrapers, not the buildings, but like the 120 by 600 ads, because only the top half is usually visible. And I'm paying the same amount for the top half of an ad as I am for a whole 300 by 250. Like that to me was the heart of like, does my creative work? Not, you know, <laughs> which, which supply paths do I have to cut off to even get my campaign to have a shot of delivering, you know, apples to apples? So I don't know, long opinionated answer, but I think that's where we started and that's where we've gotten. Hey, Brian, uh, it's Carlos here. It's an honor to speak with you. Uh, I did have a question regarding um, kind of like the, the way things are going. I see a lot of more budgets moving into CTV. Everybody's trading uh, for smart TV. There's a lot of core cutting going on. And do you ever think about like, like in addition to what's going on in the programmatic ecosystem, what's happening with e-waste, all this set, set top boxes that are not gonna be utilized anymore by satellite companies, by cable boxes. And then this older TVs like being removed from the household and just creating this mass amount of e-waste. Like, do, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it's a great question because creating electronic devices uses a lot of carbon. So very simple question is, let's say you have an old plasma TV, which sucks tons of electricity to use, and you swap it for a new OLED TV, which is super efficient, right? Yes, you're creating waste, but if the new one is twice as efficient from a power perspective, pretty quickly, you'll pay down the cost of carbon of switching because the usage is so you know, efficient relatively. I do think that we should all track the life cycle of our devices very carefully. So you know, I get a new phone every year um, and I keep thinking to myself, that that's not smart for the planet. And it's also expensive, like phones are not cheap. Um, and so that's one of my sort of personal sustainability commitments. And so actually I have a very old TV and I've been thinking like, what to your exact point, should I cut the cord? Because that means I can take out my cable box and stop powering it. I already have Wi-Fi, I already have a router. Wouldn't it be taking out like 10 watts of electricity from my house by doing that? And does that then justify I can get a better TV because I just cut my power use? Now, I, I know it's not like a real trade. Like I could also keep my old TV, but it's not a smart TV. So I can't quite, I guess I have an Apple TV, like to your point, like I think these are the sort of spreadsheet ideas we should have. Whatever we do though, we shouldn't do it every year. We should stick with what we have. We should not get a new car every three years. We should not get a new phone every year. If everybody just stretched the life cycle a little bit, we would be way more carbon efficient. And, you know, I think we're going to see, like, I think in Europe, 8K TVs, like the super high bandwidth ones are now illegal because they use too much power, which I think is kind of cool, right? Like we're starting to see like this, like honestly, like, are you like watching your TV this close? I mean, like, is that really like what you get from 8K? Like you can stand one inch from your TV and still see everything. 
Like, I want to see the pores on Drew Barrymore's nose. I mean, I, I, I think it's actually kind of like, we need a limit, right? There's got to be, you know, detailed enough. But I don't know, you guys might like that kind of thing. Absolutely, I think uh, you, you have to draw a limit there. <laughs> and thank you so much uh, for that answer. I I think we have a question from someone in the community uh, yeah, that they ask, a question. Uh, what responsibility do brands have in combating the fraud problem? Well, brands hate fraud. I mean, they it's their money that's getting wasted and taken. The, the challenge is that brands don't have the tools and often don't have the partners to help them solve it. So as an example, you know, imagine you're the head of global media at a big brand, you know, what's the first thing you do? You tell your agency, I want you to fix the fraud problem. And the agency says, great, we're going to go tell our investment teams that part of the RFP that we send every vendor is tell us how you combat fraud. And all of those vendors come back and say, we are awesome at combating fraud. We have all these tools. And, you know, we work with this brand name company and this, they use that brand name company. And this guy has data scientists. Everybody has these amazing answers to fraud. They all send those back up. They put those in a beautiful deck and they send it back to the brand and say, look at this. This is amazing. Like there are so many amazing fraud solutions here. Like, look, a great job we did. And it's really hard for a brand to be like, well, time out. Did that actually fix it? Because the thing is, how do you know how much fraud you have? The whole point of fraud is it's hard to know. There's an article in the New York Times yesterday about how people can't tell a $200 fancy bag from the Canal Street from a $10,000 fancy bag that you got at you know, some fancy luxury retailer. I mean, if you can't tell the difference, what's the point? And that's the issue. So you almost need another layer of either technology or best practices that somebody from the outside says, hey, this is how you stop fraud. The IAB has been publishing something called a bots and spiders list for about 20 years. And the funny thing is it's like fraudsters are smart. Like these are like people who make money by getting around systems. Do you think that if I'm a fraudster that I'm like, wow, some slow you know, trade association publishes an Excel file once a year or once a quarter, like you just told me <laughs> what not to look like. All I have to do is every quarter come up with a new, you know, alias or a new set of servers and they will literally never catch me because by the time they publish it, I'll be on to the next one. Now, of course, that's the least effective solution. So I think that the thing for brands and I feel for them is that in almost every category, if you say, well, what are, what should brands do to stop privacy violations. I don't know if you saw this thing with Pubmatic last week, where like they literally were ignoring GDPR signals, which is, I, mean, I can't understand why they didn't get fined a hundred million dollars. Like it is a blatant violation. And, you know, everyone's like, yeah, that sucks. I mean, shouldn't brands be jumping up and down and saying that, like, how are you preventing that? What tools do you have to prevent that? Hey, industry groups, how is this even possible? Why aren't you freaking out? That's the thing I don't get is the outrage is missing. It's like they're so used to programmatic being a mess that they don't even care anymore. And that makes me hurt because this was something that I created to solve a problem for the industry. So it's exactly this. And so last week I was in Istanbul talking to the global heads of media and CMOs of the biggest advertisers in the world. And the conversations were like amazing. I mean, I talked to the head of like the CMO of Europe for P&G about accessibility in ads for the 15% of older, older adults who struggle to see and have to use technology to make pages bigger or even have screen readers. And a lot of ads don't have uh, subtitles or, or closed captioning. And so these ads aren't even addressing this category of the population. Like that's a business opportunity, but it's also an inclusion. I mean, shouldn't they be annoyed by ads as much as everybody else? Like why does you know your grandma get to avoid ads. Like, that's not fair, you know? So I think that's the stuff that brands can drive, right? That's brands seeing opportunities and encouraging innovation. That to me is where we want to, as, as professionals, be part of the, the solution. Find ways to solve these problems, encourage the industry to adopt, 
bring brands into the conversation and understand it's their money and it's their businesses on the line. And always, whatever you do when you trade, don't go for stupid vanity metrics. Don't do the stuff that's easy. Don't buy crap at a low CPM just to bring the numbers down. Always remember it's somebody's money. It's somebody's business. It's somebody who's trying really hard to, to market to a set of consumers. And we have to do right by them. It feels like it's our obligation to them as much as it's their obligation to hold us accountable. Brian, I uh, wanted, wanted to ask you, there's a strong push in the industry right now to reduce ad fraud, reduce MFA, made for advertising websites, uh, the uh, reduce disinformation websites, and, and also there's another push to increase attention metrics now. Uh, have you seen any correlation with buying the low carbon inventory and any correlations with those topics like MFA, fraud, uh, disinformation, and attention metrics? Yeah, I mean, shockingly, if you buy crap, it doesn't work very well. So if you buy a bunch of made for advertising content farm inventory that's buying cheap fake users, they don't perform very well. And so it's also, if you have 47 ads on a page that are all viewable by the MRC, I, I challenge you, this might be a fun party game, to look for at least one second at all 47 ads before they refresh. Like, I think that could be like a challenge. Like if you can actually look at all of these before they disappear, then you get a prize from the website and you get to do it again. And that's where attention is funny because all the attention vendors are doing in many cases is like common sense. Like if you have a little tiny ad on the side of the screen, that's like playing some random content and then streaming a video ad, like that's not in stream, but guess what? It counts as in stream, it counts as viewable and no one will ever look at it. And that's, that's really damaging to the industry. So yes, we do see very strong correlation between attention and effectiveness. We see correlations between real content and effectiveness and real people and effectiveness. Sustainability connects to those because it's like, what's the most effective we can be per gram of carbon? So if you have a zero effectiveness ad, it doesn't matter how much carbon, it's worthless. So we have a product that we're launching next week called Climate Shield, which I think is a cool name for this. But basically it's just don't buy crap, you know? And I know that's not the best tagline, but like, I, I think really, like everyone's like, so, you know, in Istanbul, I go on stage and I'm like, we've proven that by buying green, you can like get better performance. And everyone's like, wow, that's mind boggling. And I'm like, yeah, we just didn't buy crap, you know? And it's just like me and my house. Like if I buy a bunch of crap for my kids that they use once and we throw away, like that's really a waste of money. Forget carbon. Media is just like anything else. Don't buy crap. <laughs> what a great slogan. I, I absolutely love it. And, and thank you so much for like illustrating how, at least in, in the media buying standpoint, like we know that it should be like more efficient and where understand exactly where do we need to buy. But I would like to know also, like, how would you advise from the publisher side as like how you as a publisher, you can become greener or not critical and risky. I think it was the other label. So as a publisher, like how do you Yeah, like so operate? if you're a publisher, like how would you effectively become more greener? Like like you would yeah. say, like, of course, you need to like cut your demands and like check constantly or uh, maybe your pre auctions to see how many times because that's absolutely a waste of energy for all the bidders that are bidding at the same time. Uh, but at the same time, as a publisher, you do struggle a lot with earning CPMs and having like maybe 20% of the revenue that actually goes to uh, all the intermediaries platforms that are in between. So like, how could we do it from our standpoint into become greener without losing much more money, I guess? Yeah, well, I think the first step is don't allow programmatic reselling. So I'd rather you have 25 direct partners and no reselling than have five direct partners and a lot of resellers. 
for a lot of reasons, but mainly because then you control all the economics and you know where your impressions are going. My issue with the redirects, like the reselling, is you don't have a direct relationship with those companies. So you can tell your partners, you have to do the right thing for privacy, or you can't run certain kinds of ads, or you know, I don't want you to do X, Y, Z. The problem is when they sell it to somebody else, that means all the data from your site is going to that partner and you lose control. Even And don't forget, there's an ID attached to it because everyone's sending all these IDs. They're sinking cookies, they're dropping things on your page. Like, Every one of those intermediaries increases your risk on many dimensions, and they're taking your money. So if there's companies out there, I'd rather you say, hey, I don't work with Pubmatic directly. Maybe I'm going to call Pubmatic and say, I'd like you to be one of my bidders, but I'm going to turn you off as a reseller. That drives control, and that drives value. Um, and that's, I think, really important for publishers. Now, do you need 25 or do you need 17? That's just an economic process of making choices. But it's the thousand reseller lines in an ads.txt that drive me crazy. So that's my recommendation to publishers is start by turning off as many resellers as you can. Uh, and maybe there's some you can't, but that will dramatically reduce your impact because every line in ads.txt is another request that could happen on your page. And so, you know, we have a bunch of data on this and publishers who are curious, we'd be happy to share and say like, you know, where are you in the scale? Are you green enough? Um, I don't know how much enough is, but compared to other sites, we can tell you pretty clearly that, you know, if you have a thousand lines of as.txt, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, it's really hard for me to rationalize that when there's only a 30 or 40 DSPs. Like, why do you need a thousand auctions to get to 30 or 40 DSPs. There's something wrong with that. So I could say more, but that's more or less the hypothesis. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Um, I have an, uh, another question for you. There's a, there's a push right now to move dollars from direct IOs buying directly from the publisher into more like pro buying PMPs, uh, private marketplaces, uh, programmatic guarantee PGs. Uh, do you have like um like any thoughts on that? Like, are we moving in the right directions? Is is one supply path more greener than the other one? Well, one of the problems with pre bid in general is that all the auctions happen regardless of how you buy. So even if you buy a guaranteed line, all the auctions happen and then they all lose. So it's not any more or less efficient from a carbon perspective. It'd be interesting to go back to how it used to be where guaranteed would run. And then if nothing was guaranteed, then you decide to go look for another buyer. And so I don't know if the industry will switch, but today, right now, purely from a carbon perspective, the best thing we can do is clean up the as.txt and all of the resellers because it will make everything more efficient. Um, in terms of business, whether it's more efficient, really interesting question about scarcity. So the only thing in a market economy that drives value and prices is scarcity. And you can create that scarcity by, you know, actually limiting how many fancy bags you make, although welcome to Canal Street, or you can try to increase the value of your bag through like branding, marketing, or in our world, you know, by adding context or by adding signals or by making your ads work better. And I think the biggest challenge to all of those dynamics right now is actually things like fraud, content farms, mysteries, all the bad stuff that's happening makes it like we basically all live on Canal Street. So the programmatic world to me is being destroyed. Like the value of content and advertising is being destroyed by these knockoffs. So if you go back to my climate hypothesis, I'm trying to shut down Canal Street in the programmatic industry and let all these really beautiful bags that people put all this money into, AKA real premium content, get their true actual value. And I think that's the heart of like, what we, we need to get to, to drive CPMs up, to drive outcomes for advertisers. Um, not sure if that answers the question, but that's, that's sort of the hypothesis, I think, driving a lot of how I think about this. Thank you for that. Manuela, you wanna 
go ahead and ask the next one. Uh, no, I thought, uh, Ellen, if you had a, yep. a note. Yeah. Uh, so I have a quick note because I want to make sure everybody don't miss what uh, Brian is saying is that when we talk about SPO traditionally, yes, it is more of a, on the publisher side, but as buyers, as traders, it can be as easy as when he says maybe not working with resellers in every single one of your DSP right now, you have the option to uncheck something that's resellers or new exchanges. So like in, for instance, in DV360, if you go in your, um, your SSP, your, your inventory partners settings, you can literally un uncheck that. And that's as simple as doing that. This is how we can participate in this mission. It's paying attention to these little details that is sneaking in from the DSP because for some reason they want us to, to, to bid on all of those resellers. And there's another thing too, you hear me preach here is that you no longer have to work with every single one of those partners. You no longer have to have 20 to 50 segments, data segments, third-party data segments in your, in your campaigns now. Make sure you start looking at those top three to top 10, and then you keep working with them. And when it's not working, reach out to them and let them know it's, it ain't working. Why not? Because it used to work. And so that's what, when Brian says, you know, limit your resellers, stop buying crap. It means just that we don't need all of them anymore. Some of them will work really well with some clients and that is okay. Now, I think the question you just asked Carlos about the direct partnership is really key. I think I see the, the industry moving more on a 50-50, right? Direct versus open exchange. Y'all know I still believe in open exchange, but it's up to us to look at those data segments post verification, like post campaign to optimize down to that site list, to that seller, because one, well, nobody else is going to do it for us and co doesn't do it as well. So any AI that you're working with may not doing as efficiently as you are. It will take time at first, but you're going to build some of that resistance. I mean, you're going to build some of that, that knowledge and remember the good partners and the partners that need to, to be reached out to. Um, so it's a lot of information that we're sharing today, but just because it's a lot and it's scary does not mean that we should ignore it. Okay. And sometimes, like I said, it's as easy as that step of unchecking the reseller list or making sure you're only starting to test two to three vendors at the time and then moving from there. Okay. So <clears throat> I just wanted to share that and bring things together. Uh, Manuel, go ahead. Thank you, Ellen. And I think that that was really important because yeah, it was, it's a lot of information and it's very new. Like uh, I think I, I've, I haven't seen that many companies, maybe one or two that are also talking about scope three emissions from programmatic. So uh, it's a lot to take in, but also I think if you're into climate change like me, like I know Andrea also, she used to work on that. Uh, it's very interesting because to me, it was impossible to merge like technology and see if like, it makes sense, but like digitally, it seemed crazy. So Ryan, I wanted to ask you like very briefly, if you can give us like a small summary of what are the types of resources that maybe an agency or a publisher, I know if you've mentioned it along the way, but if you can like summarize it, what are the types of resources that we can go or we can find in scope free uh, if you're a publisher, if you're an agency, if you're a buyer? Yeah, so right now I think the industry has been on a, Kind of a tidal wave of interest in sustainability. It's been amazing. Um, I've been working on a Lumascape of sorts for sustainable advertising, like who's actually doing what. Uh, and I published it yesterday on Bach on Ads, my blog, and I was kind of shocked at how many companies were on it. Um, it was about 100. And a year ago, it would have been about 10. And I think there's probably 10 to 20 new ones a month right now, just shocking and exciting. Um, but there is a lack of like a central set of resources. And so one thing that I've been working on, aside from publishing research, like we mentioned at the beginning of this call or, or the, the Greenscape uh, that I put together, um, is to start aggregating some of the resources. The most common question I get is, what can I read? What can I watch? Where do I go? And so 
I've started actually um, started to put together a list of educational resources. Um, there's courses that you could take. Um, there's there's blogs to read. There's things. So uh, would love to just keep aggregating those. Probably we'll put them on the Scope Three website, but also there are groups like um, you know the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership that has a, a course on this. Um, there's there's consultancies doing trainings. So my, my biggest fear is that this is yet another set of acronyms that you have to learn. And I really don't want everybody to have to be a master of ad tech and a master of sustainability jargon. Somebody came up with the grams CO2 EPM, GCO2 EPM. I'm like, literally the worst. It's not a three letter acronym. That's like seven. And having to explain all those letters is going to make my head explode. Like, can we not go there? You know, so it's a great question. And I think this forum to ask these questions in a safe space is critical. I think we as an industry need more of the safe conversation where you, you can ask maybe a naive question. Maybe you don't know what CO2E means and you want to. By the way, most people don't know what the PM means. They're like, per thousand, why is it an M? You know, well, it's the exact same level. And so any ideas about how to start making this easy and simple for folks to not have to be experts is really, really important and not to accidentally greenwash. One thing we debate at Scope 3 all the time is I said, I want to help people make sustainable decisions. And my co-founder, Anne, said, well, is it really sustainable? And like we went down this rabbit hole where I was like, hey, it's not, it's not perfect. It's not like the end of all decisions, you know, but it's a better decision. And it's a decision made with sustainability in mind. And I can prove it's more sustainable. And she's like, well, why don't we make the tagline, help people make more sustainable decisions? I'm like, it doesn't roll off the tongue. Like you don't want a tagline that has an asterisk. Like, you know, we help people make asterisk, more sustainable asterisk decisions about asterisk GCO2 PM. Oh, I forgot the E, you know, like let's just give ourselves some, some space to do the right thing or try. Um, sorry, I got distracted from your question, which was, there is no great perfect resource. However, I feel compelled to help the industry compile that and to have great conversations like this. Absolutely. Thank you. And it's, it's super valuable. And, and anything that you can share with us and we can share with the community and just add the links, that's really valuable because the, like the idea of this podcast, of course, is to be able to showcase all these great ideas that are happening and that people can find easy ways to find information because I think, I think that's one of the things that we talk about constantly, like how difficult maybe it is to find resources. And as I always talk in English uh, with Ellen, sorry, that especially with, in other languages is even more difficult. So it's great to have this kind of spaces. Brian, I, I did want to ask, uh, I was fortunate enough to be in the programmatic IO last, last year, and, and I saw the panel where you spoke about lazy loading on the, on the pub side. Uh, can, can you talk about a little bit more, uh, explain what lazy loading is and why do you feel that if that's enabled, it would reduce the, the carbon emission and the carbon footprint? Yeah, so the idea of lazy loading is Imagine you have a scrollable page and the top, the ads show with the content. On the bottom, there's also ad slots, but there's no one looking at them yet. And so the idea of lazy load, it's a feature in Google's ad server, GAM, where it waits until you scroll nearby before it loads the ad. So it's, it, it's sort of a lazy load. And it massively increases viewability because you know, otherwise, if the user just clicks the page and then leaves, all those ads are never seen. And the amount of carbon to display a non-viewable ad is basically the same as for a viewable ad. And so if you think about all the non-viewable ads as being just wasted carbon, well, I mean, you can optimize your campaign for viewability, but there's still a question like, why are they even there? Why, why do we need to show these ads? It's not a newspaper that I'm printing and sending to your house where it'd be very difficult not to have the ads. Um, so this is a publisher choice. And the reason publishers show non-viewable ads is because we pay them for it. Right now, the difference in CPM between a non-viewable ad and a viewable ad is tiny, which is crazy. Come on, traders. Like, you can't figure this out. And I think the industry intentionally makes it very, very hard to figure it out. 
So the best case would be um, there are exchanges. Uh, TrustX is an example that's 100% viewable. If you buy from TrustX, you only pay for views. And if we all shifted spend to 100% viewable inventory, that would start creating a CPM difference where publishers would be like, actually, I want my ads to be viewable. Another thing we can do is look at total carbon on a view basis. And if you say to the Washington Post, on a per view basis, you guys are 30% higher in carbon than the New York Times, so I'm gonna shift spend, they'll change their layout. But I believe that this industry responds to money. And the reason folks, and that's not pejorative. I mean, if you're a publisher, literally your job function is make money to pay the journalists, right? And we want them to do that. Actually, societally, democracy thrives on great journalism that's free. We don't want it only to be rich people that get good information and everybody else is stuck with, you know, crap because we, we don't fund it. Um, so for the sake of democracy, we want to go fix advertising, but we have to make the economic incentives align with the behaviors we want. So that's where lazy loading, I keep saying to the industry group, like just mandate it. And they're scared because every time they threaten to do it, publishers call and say, my revenue will drop by a third. And I keep saying, no, if everybody does it at the same time, nothing changes because those ads don't work. No one's actually paying for the non-viewed ones. They're, they're averaging it. And on average, CPMs would go up by a third and nothing else would change. And the number of ads would go down by a third. Like there's no difference. If you only sell me the ripe bananas for the same price that you were selling me two more rotten bananas, I get the same amount of good bananas for the exact same price. And everyone looks at me like I'm crazy. Maybe that doesn't make any sense to you, but to me, I don't want to pay for the rotten ones. You know, my, my, so if I CPB, you know, I don't care about cost per banana. I care my CPRB. I only want to pay for ripe bananas. Again, this has gone nowhere. So clearly I need a better analogy or a better way of explaining this, or I got to figure out a different way to make it happen. But that's the whole lazy load thing. It's still driving me crazy. As you can tell, I just passionately frustrated with myself for not figuring out how to get the industry to fix this one. Amazing and very controversial. Uh, I will make sure to share this with all the publishers I've worked with. Uh, and well, I think our time is almost up, Ryan. I wish we would have more time to talk and get to know more about scope three. But um, I we wanted to ask you like one last question uh, that it was more of a fun side of question. If you could share with us, what is your favorite documentary or movie about climate change? So we can wrap up this perfect conversation. The one that uh, motivated me, that really kind of changed my vantage is um, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, you know, which came out, man, I mean, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. I, mean, I grew up in Oregon. And so I grew up in spotted owl territory but also in timber territory. So I grew up with this deep controversy, classmates of mine in the timber industry and classmates of mine who were, I kid you not, like chaining themselves to trees. And I'll say this, that the best thing about growing up in Oregon was we were all friends, even though we had different views because we understood that people had different perspectives. I think the inconvenient truth for me was this realization that it wasn't global warming, it was climate change. And I think for me, that was understanding that we're not just talking about one dynamic. We're talking about this incredible weather system. I mean, think about, you know, something like, you know, the, the wind patterns that cause Northern Europe to be warmer than they than it should be, right? The Gulf Stream keeps Europe warm. Like, what if that stops? What if the fundamental dynamics mean that Europe gets really cold and the rest of the world gets way too hot. Like it's not gonna be everything warms up uniformly. And like this extreme weather is because of climate. Like, I don't know, that now seems probably obvious to everyone, but like at the moment for me, the idea of just how disastrous this was, you know, it's not about warm, it's about extreme. Um, just, I don't know, just honestly scared the crap out of me. And I remain pretty terrified that we're walking into something that we don't understand, a planet that will not be conducive to how we've lived as a species, um, it takes my breath away still. And uh, 
yeah, if I ever seem like I'm kind of crazy about these things, it's because I'm actually scared and I, I, I'm worried. And, uh, you know, I do everything I can to change what I can, which is this little world. And I hope you all join me because it really is important and it's meaningful. Um, and it's not enough. I could, nothing I can do or you can do on our own is enough. We have to convince everyone we interact with that this is more important than, you know, the next new fancy TV or iPhone or whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry so to much. end this on a depressing note. I, no, no, yeah. it's it's perfect. Like there are no documentaries about the climate that are not super sad and depressing. I, I saw Sea Spiracy very recently and I cried for the turtles and I stopped eating tuna. So yeah. Thank you so much again, Ryan, for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think we've learned so much and I have the ideas and everyone has the idea more, more clear. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real honor and uh, so excited for everyone who's involved in Ellen's project to just keep learning and growing and be part of this awesome programmatic community. So thank you all. Thank you, Brian.